<laughs> wow, well, yeah, we are excited to have a grandson. I've had a hard time letting my girls grow up. It's the hardest thing I've ever done is letting my, my four little girls grow up. And, but now I get a little grandbaby. Yeah. So we're excited. Great to be here with you. Are you excited to be at church? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, right on. Well, it's, uh, it, it has been a great weekend so far, you know, Friday night with the youth, last night at Interlight Surf Shop, the, the event there. It's been a great weekend so far, but I tell you, you know, as I get older, leaving my family is harder and harder because I realize how valuable the time is because it's running out, and I didn't see that as well in my 20s or 30s, but now that I'm about to be 42 on the 23rd of this month, I realize more and more how valuable the time is. So anyway, uh, I appreciate you guys for the reception and the love. And, you know, I've known your pastor, like Neil said, for over 10 years now. And I love him and his family. And I love you guys because, you know, we're family, right? We're family. And that means a lot to me. Uh, anyway, let's do this. Let's bow our hearts, bow our heads. We're going to pray. And ask the Lord to meet us in this place. Father, we, we come to you now, and we are so thankful for the privilege, Lord, to gather together publicly, to, to come together in fellowship and encourage one another in our walks with you, and, and now to study your word. Lord, we thank you for using men to, to write your word and preserving it for thousands of years. That this morning we could open your word, reliable and inerrant, and we could receive from you, God, that we could hear from you. Lord, I pray that no one came to hear from an ex-pro boxer, <laughs> but they came to hear from you. And we invite you into this place, ask you to speak to our hearts, to plant your, the seed of your word deep in our hearts, Lord, that it might produce fruit. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, turn in your Bibles, guys, to John chapter 6. Last time I was here was about two years ago, and uh, I had the opportunity to share on a Saturday morning with the men at a men's breakfast. Had a great time there. Uh, shared one of my favorite messages to share, testimony-based messages, based on my most devastating defeat in the ring. And then the next morning, uh, the Sunday morning services, I shared a message based on my greatest pro boxing victory called The Great Comeback. That's, um, well, to, to harp on the book again, The Great Comeback. But uh, I, I love sharing testimony, you know, and certainly you know, married, divorced, remarried to the same girl, um, nearly ended my, met, the, met the Lord with a gun to my head. Uh, Drug addiction, alcohol addiction, I mean, you name it. Yeah, I've been there. And um, so I love to share testimony. Look, there's power in the testimony of the believer. Amen? Amen. And, and not just testimonies like mine that are, you know, chaos and all over the map. But every Christian's testimony is equally powerful because we were all equally radically condemned before the cross. Amen. Right? So every, every one of us, has. if you've put your faith in Jesus, if he is your Lord and Savior, you have an equally powerful testimony. And I encourage you to share it. It speaks to people. It speaks volumes when we share of the faithfulness of God, the goodness of God, the power of God to transform a life. Amen? But I love sharing my testimony, but I also love the Word of God. I, you know, Pastor Neil mentioned... I'm a Bible teacher, and I love to teach the Bible more than anything else. And that's because I know it's the Word of God that transformed my life. It's the Word of God that built, you know, that I, I was able to build a foundation on, to, to build my life upon the Word of God, the, the inerrant, unchanging Word of God. And I know that's what transforms life. So I love to teach the Bible. So that's, we're in John 6 today. I'm going to read a verse to you right now from John 16. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to read it to you. It's a familiar passage. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation, trouble. But be of good cheer, 
I have overcome the world. Yeah, amen to that. It's a familiar passage. It's not one we put on Hallmark cards. It's not one we, I don't, I don't sign things and put this verse with it. <laughs> you know, because it's, you know, in the world you will have trouble. It was a guarantee from Jesus that his followers will face trials and tragedy and tribulation and trouble. It's a guarantee. And, you know, it, I hearken back to the 10th grade. My literature teacher, Miss Bradbury, it's funny the things you remember when you're younger, but she used to always say, Ebo, life's hard, and then you die. <laughs> she wasn't much of an optimist, you know. But Miss Bradbury was, was very much a realist. You know, in truth, life is hard, and then we die. Now, now for the Christian, our death the moment I leave this body is the first time I will experience life as God intended it. That'll be the best day of my life. So praise God for the confidence we have that there is no sting in death. So praise God for that. But life is hard and then you die. <laughs> you know, I might have had to convince you of that last time I was here. I might have said life is hard and most of you would have went, well, I don't know. <laughs> Probably not now. <laughs> As you know, you know, we all face challenges in life. Uh, these are the expected normal challenges. You know, providing for our families, jobs, relational, you know, issues. Um, the new phrase now is adulting, right? You guys know that phrase? Everybody, all these millennials talking about their adulting. <laughs> Start having kids, you're getting closer. <laughs> I love my girls. I love them. Transform. They changed my life having my girls. But, but, you know, adulting, normal challenges. We all have this. And in addition to the expected challenges there are in life, there are the storms of life. These are the unexpected things that come. Tragedy strikes. We have both of these. And today in our text, we're going to see both types of of challenges, the normal ones that we expect to come along with life. In this case, it'll be provision, the feeding of the 5,000. And we're going to see in the last part, verses 15 through 21, in this case, it's thinking you're going to die on the Sea of Galilee as your ship goes down in a hurricane. You know, that may not apply to any of you guys, but we're going to see the unexpected tragedy strikes and how to respond to that. So follow with me here. We're going to start in verse 1. It says, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. So Jesus now, um, you know, the, the other accounts say that he has been teaching this crowd for most of the day. It's been a long day, um, and, and the people are there, and, uh, and he, he wanted to find a place to get some rest, some R&R &R with his disciples, but it says, now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. And Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, said to Philip, get this, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? So verse 10 says that this is about 5,000 men. If you include the women and children, it might be as many as 15,000 people. And in verse 5, Jesus asked Philip, where are we going to get lunch for these people? You know, here he, is, he gives an impossible situation to Philip and his disciples. It's a, a situation far beyond their resources and their ability. And like we're going to see in a minute... They can't fix it or solve it. And I would expect that many of you can relate to that in this season. You're in a situation that's far bigger than you. You've encountered a challenge that you have no way to figure out how to get out of it, right? You can't fix it. You don't have the resources. Believe me, man, I'm, I'm with you guys. And you're like... 
<laughs> what now, right? You know, thankfully, man, the predicaments we face never surprise God. Have you been surprised this year by anything? <laughs> We've been surprised by a lot this year, right? This has been a, an interesting year, 2020. What an interesting year. And I've been surprised by a lot of things, but none of these things have surprised God. The next verse, verse 6, makes this very clear. It says, but this he said to them, to, this he said to test him, rather, for he knew himself what he would do. What does that mean, guys? He said this to test him, for he knew what he would do. That means Jesus had a plan through this. He had a plan through it. And, and what gives me great encouragement is I know he has a plan for me as well. And guys, he has a plan for you, whatever you face today, no matter how dire the circumstances might seem, how impossible it seems to navigate what you're experiencing, Jesus has a plan through it. Now his plan, I don't know what it is specifically for you, it's obviously different in every case, but ultimately the plan that Jesus has is that we would grow spiritually to trust him more, right? That's his plan through every, every trial, every tragedy, every struggle, is that we would, we would grow spiritually, we would mature through that, and that we would look to him and trust him more and more as we go. It's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, a familiar passage, but it says to trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all of your ways, and he will make your path straight. So this growth, you know, spiritual growth is the desired result of testing. That's what God desires. You know, I'll be honest with you, though, I don't like testing. Does anybody here like testing? Because <laughs> I'd love to talk to you. Seriously. I didn't like testing in school, and I certainly don't like spiritual testing. But I realized, look, a good teacher never gives a test for their benefit. It's always for the student's benefit. That's what a test is for, to benefit the student, that they will grow, they will learn. And in this context, that they will grow spiritually. You know, I feel like the test, the spiritual test I most often experience, they're pop quizzes, aren't they? <laughs> There's not enough notice, right? It's like, oh, Lord, just, you know, here's what we need to do. We, would, we need to remember from now on when you're in a test, put a footnote. This is just a test. You need that footnote to remind you as soon as it starts to go, hey, hey, hey this is just a test. Don't freak out, guys. It's just a test. It's going to be okay. Because Jesus allows this testing in our life for our, for, for our benefit, to grow us, to develop us, and mature us. But I don't like testing no more than anybody here. But here in verse 7, you know, I haven't got this all figured out, guys. Philip hasn't got it figured out either. In verse 7, Philip answers and says, Well, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them. That every one of them may have a little. So instead of trusting Jesus, what does Philip do? He begins calculating. I know I'm guilty of that often. You know, I'll, I'll, uh, I guess financially is probably the first things that come to mind. I'm just, Lord, how's it going to work out? <laughs> right? I pull out the calculator like Philip. I start punching buttons, crunching numbers. It's what we often do instead of our first resort being, Lord, you got this. It's just a test. <laughs> But he, he starts calculating. He comes to the conclusion that six months of wages won't be enough to buy food for this crowd. He calculated the size of the crowd. He calculated the price of God or price of bread. He failed to calculate the size of God. Guys, look, nothing you could ever face will be bigger than God. Nothing you could ever face. What are you facing today? What's on the horizon, this, this thing that keeps you up at night? What are you on your knees crying out to God about? 
What are you worrying about? What breaks your heart? It's not bigger than God. It's not. It's not bigger than God. Nothing you could ever face will be bigger than God. Here, Philip, he fails to calculate the size of God. The size of God, the faithfulness of God, the power of God, the love of God. He fails to calculate the most important thing. But verse 8 says, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, and I love the optimism initially, there's a, a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. Ah, but what are they among so many? Barley loaves, a, a, a tortilla, you know, it's, it's a pita bread, it's, it's not a loaf. Like when I, I used to read this and I'd imagine loaves of bread, you know. Something of substance. It wasn't. This was, a, this was often fed to animals, a, a poor man's bread. And it's just a little pita, a little tortilla, you know. And it says here, small fish. It literally, in our, in our day and age, it'd be an anchovy, right? <laughs> it sounds delicious, doesn't it? <laughs> We're going to have tortillas and anchovies for lunch. But he says, hey, there's a little lad here. In Matthew 14, Matthew's account of this, of this miracle, Jesus says to them, bring it to me. Bring the fish. Bring the tortillas. <laughs> right? Bring the anchovies to me. And you, know, you look at this and you, and you think, they didn't have much, but they brought it to Jesus. And I'd ask you today, you know, you, you have these challenges in life. I don't know what it is for you, but what do you have? You know, I spent some time with Jimmy Falbo Friday over at his dojo. There was a time when Jimmy said, Lord, all I've got is a dojo. But I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to use it for you, Lord. You know, an inner light surf shop. Lord, all I've got is a surf shop, but I'm going to use it for you. You might hear, be here this morning. You might say, you know, Lord, all I got is a broken marriage. But I'll give it to you. I got a small paycheck, but it's yours. All I got is my, my little old life, but I give it to you. They give it to Jesus. And then, I love this in verse 10. Not only they use what they had. And they give it to Jesus. And then, and then they did what they could do. Look at this, verse 10. Jesus says, make the people sit down. They could do that, right? That's not complicated. They couldn't do much else. You know, if you look at it all together, they really couldn't do much else. They didn't have much to offer. They had very, very little to offer. But what they had, they used what they had. They didn't go out scouting for more food, rummaging through the crowd to get more food. They used what they had. Look, I encourage you guys, use what you have. Give it to Jesus and use it. You might have, you know, you got enough strength to push a broom? <laughs> push a broom. You got enough strength to, or courage or boldness to share the gospel with somebody in Starbucks? Share it. Use what you've got. Use what you got. Give it to Jesus. Use it for Jesus. And then just do what you can do. They say, hey, yeah, we, we, can, we can sit the people down, Lord. Okay. Hey, guys, over here, sit down. Yep. Yeah, we're helping Jesus. <laughs> they're, 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 it's good. They couldn't do much else, but they can make the people sit down. You might not feel like you can do much, but you can do something. You know, this crowd coming to Jesus you know, other accounts say that the disciples told Jesus to tell them to go away. Y'all know that, yeah. Said, hey, tell them to go away, Jesus. They're going to faint on their journey. It's been a long day. You've been teaching a Bible study for like eight hours now. And, you know, it's, let's tell them to go home so they can get some food. Jesus made them aware of the situation, aware of the need. And they tried to put the need off on somebody else. Look, when you're aware of a need... I would suggest it's the Lord making you aware of it so you can do something about it. Amen? 
What did he say? He said, look, the, the, the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. You know, so what did he say? Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he, that he might send laborers into the harvest. You know what happens when you pray, Lord, there's a great work to be done. Send somebody. I always find the Lord saying, hey, what about you? What are you waiting on? Do what you can do. Use what you've got. Give it to the Lord and do what you can do. Make the people sit down. And there was much grass in that place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, listen, as much as they wanted. Wow. We're not far off from Thanksgiving. You guys know what this feels like, right? At Thanksgiving, you eat some turkey and ham and stuffing and banana pudding and brownies. I did in that order. Some sweet potato souffle and some, I don't know what else you like. And you're stuffed to the max and you're rolling around on the sofa. I can never eat again. And then 20 minutes later, you're hungry. And you go back and get more. I mean, these, this crowd, they were glutted they were glutted in the in the original language they had all they wanted and what we see here we see you know these disciples they they did what they could do they made the people sit down and then they go to jesus jesus blesses the bread he breaks the bread and he gives it to them and this you know supernatural work takes place the creation of bread you wonder when exactly it happened. You know, there are lots of different ideas there. When exactly the bread was being created. This bara, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Creating from nothing. Not taking already existing elements and working them together. But creating from nothing. And here, Jesus creates this bread from nothing. And he gives it to his disciples. And, and notice here, they go and they're distributing it to the crowd. But they always have to go back to Jesus to get more, right? They, they, you know, if they, if they don't go back to Jesus, they have nothing left to give. And I find in this, we see a principle for us. Guys, we're called to be distributors. We're not called to manufacture or to create something that, that people need. We're called to just take what God so generously gives us, the Word of God and the love of Christ, mercy and compassion and truth. And we take that and we distribute it to the world. And then we go back and we get more. It's a dangerous thing. If we fail to go back, we run out, don't we? We come up empty. We come up shorthanded. But if we go back, Jesus is generous and, and blesses us and gives us more to take to the world. We're distributors. So when they were filled, verse 12. He said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which are left over by those who had eaten. That, the word basket there, literally, it's a, it's a personal size basket. It, it's, a, it's enough, you know, it's something that you could manage. One person could manage to carry and it would hold enough bread for a person. It's like a, a personal size pan pizza. For some reason that comes into my mind. I don't know. But it's a personal size basket. And they had 12 of them. Each of them had their own personal size basket. <laughs> Therefore, they gathered them up, the 12 baskets. And then those men, verse 14, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, they said, truly, this is the prophet who's coming to the world. Therefore, when Jesus perceived they're about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and went over the sea toward Capernaum. Mark's account says that Jesus made them get into the boat. You imagine what's going on here. This has been an incredible event. Multitudes of people are you know, they're, they're, they're glutted, they're stuffed with, no doubt, the best 
fish and bread we've ever eaten, right? And, um, and they want to take Jesus by force and make him king. And the disciples are thinking, hey, he's going to establish the kingdom in Israel again. We're going to be at his right and his left. And yeah, sounds good to me, you know. This was, you know, and the crowd, certainly they all wanted to get to Jesus. But you can't get to Jesus, right? But you can get to his disciples. You can't always get to the, the front man of the band or, you know, whatever. But you can get to the, the, the roadies, right? You can talk to the, the band manager, maybe. And they're, they're trying to get, so I'd imagine Peter and John and James and them guys, they're thinking they're going to melt the moment. Let's enjoy this, guys. It's finally time to establish the kingdom. We're going to rule and reign with Christ. It's going to be great. They've got no idea, do they? They got no idea. It says Jesus made them get in the boat. I get the idea. They didn't want to get in the boat. Like, Come on, Jesus. Let's just hang out some more, man. They love us. <laughs> get in the boat. <laughs> get in the boat. He made them get in the boat. You know, Jesus had other plans. For his disciples. The great thing about Jesus, he is a he is a great, he is the good teacher. Because if you fail a test, he'll just keep giving it to you. <laughs> Doesn't he? He does. They failed the first test. How are we gonna where are we gonna get food to feed this crowd, guys? They didn't respond with the faithful responding of, oh Lord. You're the creator of the heavens and the earth. You know all things. You can handle it. You've got this. They start calculating and figuring and, uh, well, you know, you know the story. So now it's time for test number two. It's, you know, the Lord will keep giving you a test until you pass it. If you're tired of the test, pass it. <laughs> Just pass the test. Ugh. And it was dark, and Jesus had not come to them. Verse 18, then the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. Look, guys, this is a storm of instruction that they face. Not, not correction, so to speak, but Jesus sent them into this storm for instruction. He's teaching them. He's the good teacher. Maybe you're in a storm today. Is it correction or is it instruction? And navigate appropriately, right? They go into this storm. You know, Mark 6, 48. I love this. Mark's account says that he saw them. Listen, he saw them straining at rowing for the wind was against them. Listen at that. He saw them. They had been, you know, rowing for hours and hours and you know, it's the whole two step, you know, one step forward, two steps back. They're, they're rowing their guts out for hours. We're going to see they haven't made it far. And Jesus saw them. Maybe you feel like life today. Maybe you're in a storm right now and you're rowing your guts out. Quit rowing and start praying. Quit rowing and start praying. Because look, I assure you, Jesus sees you. He sees. The Bible says that he is intimately acquainted with the details of our life. The psalmist would declare, Lord, you know, who am I that would, you would even think of me? And I agree. But he does. And he sees you right where you're at. Right in the middle of that struggle, that storm, that difficult situation, that painful thing. He knows what grieves you. He knows what brings you great joy, and he sees. Mm. It's a good place to be. He saw them. Verse 19 says, so when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. <laughs> Other accounts say they thought he was a, a ghost. But he says to them, it is I, it is I, do not be afraid. And then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to where they were going. The first three and a half 
miles of this trip. You know, seven miles across the Sea of Galilee. I had the great privilege of going there earlier this year, my first trip to Israel. Got to go out on the Sea of Galilee and just imagine being in this, this situation with the Lord in a boat. Had my 16-year-old daughter with me. What a blessing to take her. And If you haven't been to Israel, go to Israel. Pray about it. The Lord will provide. He, he did for me. But the, 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 this trip, seven miles across, the first three and a half miles of this trip took, you know, other accounts, it, it, it was probably about as many as nine hours, eight or nine hours of rowing. Do the math. That's not fast rowing, right? Three and a half miles, eight or nine hours. They're not making much progress. And like I said, man, they're rowing their guts out the whole way. They see Jesus. They willingly receive him into the boat. It's interesting. You know, Jesus will never force himself on anyone. He never forces himself into our situations. He never imposes his will upon us. But, but we must willingly, willingly, openly receive what he has for us. Receive him into the boat. And as soon as they did that, the last three and a half miles of this trip were covered instantaneously. Instantly. And this is worth paying attention to. This is interesting to me. I love math. Anybody here love math? Not many. Okay. <laughs> Verse 21. Look at it. Look at the last half. And immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. What happened here? I mean, this is incredible what happens. We're going to see. This, this, is, this is incredible. The current water speed record. If you're into you know, high-speed boats, I know you guys are into boats, right? There's boats all over Florida. Not as many in Hogansville where I live, Georgia. But you guys love boats, right? Well, no? The current water speed record, get this, 317 miles per hour. That's fast on the water. That's really fast. And this feat was accomplished in 1978, interestingly, the year of my birth. That has nothing to do with the message. I just point it out. At that speed, at 317 miles per hour, this three and a half mile trip would have taken 44 seconds. Not even close to instantly. Not even close. Well, at the speed of sound, which is roughly 761 miles per hour, this three and a half mile trip would have taken 16.6 seconds. Not even close to Jesus and the disciples. But traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, this three and a half mile trip would have taken one fifty-three thousandth of a second. That's what we're talking about. (laughs) That's instantaneously. What does this mean? This means Jesus and his disciples traveled at light speed. (laughs) You know, it's interesting. When you're in a storm, what is the the question we usually ask? Lord, why? When difficulty comes into your life, when tragedy strikes, Lord, why? Why me? Why now? Why this situation? Why did that happen? And understandably, I mean, I get it. If you remember Job and his friends, right, they they asked God why for 37, 38 chapters, however many it was. A long time, right? Why, 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 why? I love it. You know, no doubt Job had experienced more tragedy and trial and struggle than arguably any of us, I guess. He had went through so much. He lost his family. He lost his, all of his wealth. He lost his health. An incredibly difficult storm 
for Job. And they ask why for 38 chapters. God shows up on the scene. And he starts to talk to Job from a hurricane. That should spark your attention, I think. <laughs> Look, if anybody starts speaking to me from a hurricane, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears. You know, Only God can do that. Speak to you from a hurricane. But God never told him why. He never told him why. All God did was further reveal himself to Job. He revealed more of himself to Job. Job gave Job a more full revelation of who he is. He didn't tell him why. He told him who. And guys, look, you don't need to know why you're in a storm when you know who rules over the storm. You don't need to know why when you know who rules over it. Because then, then you can rest in Romans 8.28. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. They work together. They aren't good. All things aren't good. But they work together for good. And we can rest in that knowing that God, He rules over the storm. In this case, He sent them into the storm. In Job's case, <laughs> he sent Job into the storm. He gave Satan the authority to wreck his life. But in the end, Job came out better than he started. He came out better than he started. He came out stronger than he started. The beginning of Job talks about Job, you know, he feared God. He shunned evil. He was a righteous man. But when, when all that came against him, he said, what I have feared the most has come upon me. At the end of the book of Job, I, I'm going to ask Job one day, I'm going to say, hey, what did you fear at the end of the whole story? When it was all said and done, what did you fear more? Losing everything again or did you revere God more than that? What did you fear the most? What did you revere the most? Losing everything or God? What do you think he'd say? God. He came out better. You don't need to know why you're in the storm when you know who rules over the storm. Now, as far as this light speed travel thing, I think this is really cool. I like science. I like math. Hopefully somebody else here does. Albert Einstein, according to Albert Einstein, the theory of relativity does not forbid light speed travel. But for anything of mass, and in this case, that would be a boat and 12 men and Jesus, anything of mass to accelerate to light speed would require, don't miss this, it would require infinite energy. Infinite energy. Here, in this storm of life, like with Job, Jesus Certainly in the storm, when they were rowing their guts out for nine hours, I'm sure they were all going, why, Lord? Why? Why can't we make it faster? <laughs> why the wind? Why the waves? I'm sure they asked why a lot of times. And what did Jesus do? As soon as he got in the boat, he revealed to them more of himself. Because when you know the who, you don't need to know the why. And he reveals this to them. And, and here we see... According to Albert Einstein, it would require infinite energy to travel at light speed, to accelerate to that speed. Now look, most scientists don't believe infinite energy exists, and that's because we live in a finite universe. Our universe is about 150 billion light years wide end to end. It's pretty big. You know, it's a good, good size. Interestingly, you know, we've discovered in the 1920s, 1930s that the universe is expanding. It's getting bigger. Interestingly, the, the prophet Isaiah, 700 B.C., said that God spreads the heavens out like a curtain. The secular scientific community is slowly catching up to the Bible. But even though the universe is expanding, it's still finite. And because of that, scientists don't believe infinite energy can exist in a finite universe. What they fail to realize is although the universe is finite, God 
is infinite. God is infinite. The Bible describes the universe being the span of God's hand. It's not a formula to figure out the size of God, mind you, but it, it gives us, it's, a, it's an illustration, it's a representation of how big God really is. God is infinite. And, and even, even greater than understanding the, the size of God, God is all that He is. God is everything He is to the infinite degree. Grab on to that. Or try to. God is who he is to the infinite degree. He's not really big. He's infinite. He's not really, really good. He's infinitely good and so on and so forth. He is all that he is to the infinite degree. What does this mean for us this morning at Coastline in Gulf Breeze? Maybe you need power. Maybe you need power to overcome a drug addiction or an alcohol addiction. Maybe it's to overcome a, a, an addiction to pornography or you know, depression or anxiety. Maybe you need power to love your spouse or lead your children. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Guys, Jesus is infinite power, and he's available to you. He is infinite power, and he's available to you. Maybe this morning you say, well, Ebo, I need forgiveness. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all deserve eternal separation from God, but that you can receive the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Guys, Jesus is infinite mercy. He's infinite compassion. He is infinite forgiveness. And he's available to you. You need forgiveness this morning? He's got it. Without end, he's got enough forgiveness for you, no matter what you've done. He's got enough compassion. He's got enough mercy. And he's available to you. Maybe this morning you say, Ebo, well, I need love. I need love. Don't we all? Right? I need love. The Bible says that no greater love has one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Guys, 2,000 years ago, God manifested himself in the flesh. He became a man. He took on a human body, tabernacled in a human body. He was born in a manger, right? A feeding trough. We celebrate that this time of year. He lived a sinless life and about 30 years old, he began a public ministry. He raised up 12 men to carry on the ministry. And he went to a cross where he paid the penalty for your sin and my sin. He took our place. We deserve that place. That's where we, sh we deserved it. We all deserve it. That's where we should be, but he took our place. He took our punishment. And although he never sinned, he died a sinner's death for me and you. Three days later, he rose from the grave. He is not dead. The tomb is empty. I've been there. <laughs> the tomb is empty, guys. And he's going to come back soon to get his kids. He went to prepare a place in his, in his father's house or many mansions. If it were not so, he would have told us, right? Makes you wonder how amazing it's going to be. It took six days to create the heavens and the earth, and all that's in it. He's been working on heaven for about 2,000 years. Going to be something else. But Jesus, look, Jesus is infinite love, and he's available to you. 
no matter where you're at in your walk with Jesus this morning, He is enough because He is infinite. Let's bow our hearts.